hide your money in a sanitary pad. No one's going to look in there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <Who's not? laughs> exactly. I know. Being a solo traveler as opposed to with someone else, there's like a perception that you're doing this because no one else wanted to go with you. I went in winter, so things get dark quite easily. So I'm like, where am I? What is, is this a, is this the right road? Welcome to Bangladeshi Trailblazers podcast. I'm your host, Tasneem Hassan. The purpose of this podcast is to represent Bangladeshi talent who come from various professional backgrounds. The podcast is a segue to conduct meaningful conversations across various topics and industries. In today's episode, we are going to embark into a very adventurous and inspiring journey with Malina Firuz, who has currently completed traveling to more than 100 countries. And what I really want to do is I want her to share all about her interesting stories and experiences that she has, you know, uh, you know, been a part of. And I hope you all like this episode because I think it will definitely, definitely inspire so many other solo travelers who are willing to break the barriers and start solo traveling. So please welcome Malina Firuz. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. That was such a lovely introduction. I feel warm in my heart. <laughs> thank you so much for finding the time. Despite your very busy schedule, it's really an honor to have you on the show. Thank you. It's an honor to be on the show. It's so cool with so many amazing Bangladeshi people. And I love like the plethora of different types of professions that people have and the different amazing ways in which they are like, you know, really breaking the barrier. It's a really well-named show as well. Really Thank love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. So starting with yourself and your introduction, if you could tell our viewers as to what you do and how did you start your journey into solo traveling? Great. Um, so what I do is perhaps a very um, difficult question to answer because I do quite a few things. But what I'll <laughs> you about today is about my travels. So I started traveling at the age of four um, with my parents. They took me on my first long haul journey. I mean, we traveled within the country before that, like, you know, you go to Cox's Bazaar and so on. But I went to the UK and um, it was my first long haul flight. And it was absolutely incredible uh, for me because most kids, when they're on a plane for the first time, they're crying, right? You know, they're like, unsure what's going on. I was completely different. I don't think I've ever really cried on an airplane unless I was being emotional. Mm -hmm. uh, like emotional as like, oh, I'm leaving a place or oh, I'm going to miss this person or something. Um, so that was like a sign from the beginning that I was quite a curious child. So I was very interested in the world, what was happening around me. There was like the sky, the clouds, we were go like, you know, flying through. And I just couldn't believe it. It was so exciting. Everything was new, you know. And that feeling of everything being new and every single experience being for the first time, you know, we landed in the UK, everything looked so different, everyone looked so different. And, you know, people were speaking a different language. I didn't know much about English before that, like maybe I knew a few words, couldn't really speak before that. Then we went to um, France. We also went to Amsterdam. When I was in France, I learned like in the same trip, I learned like a few phrases, which I... I, I retained much later on in life as well because I was just <laughs> a little French kid when we were in France. And I was like, oh, bonjour, come on, on that. I learned that. And like, Je m'appelle and then your name. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't learn je m'appelle, but bonjour, come on, ça va. That's okay. it. <laughs> I learned those. So like that entire trip, which was quite a few places, and my parents, like, really, they saved everything they had for that trip to, to be able to go on that trip. Um, it... I cannot thank them enough for that. And, you know, this is something we don't think about in um, in Bangladesh as much, is that what travel does to a person's mind, right? It, it changes the way they think, you know? And that high of, oh, I'm experiencing something for the first time became so addictive for me almost. I wouldn't want to say addictive. I guess like something so exciting for me that I continue to chase that high and therefore you know, fast forward several years, decades, and here I am having been to half the world, having traveled to half the world, most of them on my own, 
uh, because I want to learn something new. I want to see something new. I want to experience something new. And while I do that, I want to showcase that. And I want to share those stories. I want people to know what's out there. But I want people to know that from the point of view of someone who looks like them or is from a similar background to them. Because one of the reasons why I started, so I'm a travel writer, right? And I started writing because all the narratives I saw on social media were written from the points of view of white Western people. Mm -hmm. And the way the storytelling works is that because of their education, because of the way they were brought up, it's very neo-colonial often. So you'd read these stories which showcase people in Africa or Asia as if like they were these exotic creatures or they're these exotic, I don't know, whatever else. <laughs> Just, 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 it's a mountain. You don't have to make it seem like, I don't know, the mountains in Africa speak to you a different language. It sounds very like neo-colonial or whatever it is. So I started writing and I started sh sharing my stories because I felt like it had to be told from the point of view of a person who's not looking at it with a colonizer mindset mm -hmm. and also looking at it as a brown Muslim Bangladeshi person, what are the things that I experienced to be able to get there? And how did I get there as opposed to like just a person from Europe whose passport is like the second best passport in the world and they can waltz in and out of countries with no big deal. So in a brief summary, that's pretty much <laughs> who I am, how I started what I started it. Awesome. Uh, so yeah. when did you first start traveling solo? Like what? at what age and which country was it? So Italy was my first ever country to travel solo. I was 20 years old. Okay. Um, and like solo in the, ter in, in the sense that not just flight solo, but like I like literally was there and I was like, okay, I have to do everything on my own. Um, I have to buy, like I have to get like a hostel, stay in a hostel, figure out how to explore the city do everything and I'd been to it was Rome so it was the city I'd been to I went there when I was 10 years old with my parents before mm -hmm. um, but as a 20 year old um, it was very frightening but also again exciting like <laughs> super it's like an adrenaline rush right it is <laughs> it's a hot they want people will. people have different types of drugs that they like to consume travel is much <laughs> exactly exactly so what was one of the i would say not one of them but like what were some of the cultural shocks that you went through when you actually landed at italy first because i i definitely have experienced that when i went to france and switzerland and i was like okay what's this happening but mm -hmm. i want to hear it from your end like what kind of things did you um notice when you just you know were traveling across in, in basically traveling in rome at that time what were some of the observations well, the first one was that i did not expect there to be that many bangladeshis <laughs> so, i don't know if you know this but italy has a ginormous bangladeshi population so i was just hearing bangla everywhere i was just like what oh. is going on where am i how is this working i don't understand um okay. So that was a big surprise. And the other bits was like trying to figure out like how to. So, you know, you go you go to restaurants wherever you go in the world and so on. But like trying to figure out. And this was, mind you, like when I was 20, so 12 years ago. So mm -hmm. like, yes, you can search things online and stuff, but it's not as easily available. We don't have they didn't have Google ratings on restaurants and so on. So figuring out where to eat and how to eat and what to navigate like how do you get from point a to point b it wasn't as easy as it is now like you just tell you put it on google and google's like okay there you go i didn't have data on my phone either so what i had to do was like essentially go to the hostel the hostel gives you a map and then they mark you go from here to here <laughs> this, is, this is what you do like proper old school and i'm like 20 years old try to read a map on my own with my dad for the first time I'm like oh my god dad help me how am I gonna do this and then you're in this city and I went in winter so things get dark quite easily so I'm like where am I what is is this a is this the right road because the language is different and what does via mean what does this mean what does that mean like I, I mean I tried to use because I um I took French in school so I had 
like French as a background and I could speak, speak some level of French at that point. So I was using my French knowledge to be able to translate and <laughs> to be able to figure out where to go, what to do. Um, and the other, yeah, the other culture shock was because there's quite a lot of Bangladeshis in Italy and in Rome. Um, sometimes there could be a little bit of uh, racism towards us. Not, I mean, I'm not going to blame this on Bangladeshis. This is not our problem. This is the problem of the people who are being racist. Mm -hmm. um, but like, um, because there's an established community of people already there, people have preconceived notions and mm -hmm. that's just not great. But I had a really otherwise good time on my first <laughs> solo trip. So I guess that would have been some of the big culture shocks when I went there. Okay, awesome. I mean, it's always great to hear that. Do you think Italian is similar to French? Isn't it more similar to Spanish? It is, uh, but there's a lot of words that are similar. So, uh, for example, um, when I spent, so it was in the same trip, I went to a different city and I spent, I think, two weeks with my friend or 10 days with my friend and her family. It was in like Perugia, which is like in the middle of Italy, a city in the middle of Italy. And her parents spoke uh, no English um, and her whole family spoke no English. So, um her mom could speak French, but nobody else did. So by but at, at the end of 10 days, I understood quite a lot of what they were saying, just because it's similar enough to French for me to pick up mm -hmm. several words. But I can't say that I, I yeah, I speak Italian. <laughs> it's just that they're both Latin languages. You can, so you can navigate. You can, you can sort of navigate. If you have a flair for languages, you can kind of navigate. Definitely. I still remember a story of my like career. Once um, my boss basically assigned me a Spanish client and um, I had to call them and I realized this man cannot speak in English. And I, I studied French too for like eight years in school. So what I did was I basically understood that French is similar to Spanish. So I just used the Google translator to talk to my client. And my boss was just looking at me. He's like, you know Spanish? I'm like, no, <laughs> I know French. So like, I just use Google Translator to like use that accent and like to talk to him. And so that was a very, very interesting story out there. So yeah, I think Latin yeah. languages kind of have that similarity. So yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, no. Moving on, moving on. I wanted to know. As a person <laughs> who started traveling at the age of 20 solo, do you think mm. there were some kind of like obstacles or like um, uh, you would, I would say stigmas that you would have to face along the way? Or do you think that it was it was pretty easy to break the taboo out there for yourself? No, no, no. And obviously, it's like completely difficult or was really <laughs> difficult. I mean, there no, I. A woman, like, honestly, I have nothing but respect for every single solo woman traveler, female traveler, like doing this on your own, especially in some of the places I've been to. I was just like, I just don't know how I'm even OK. Um, I think there was a lot of uh, safety concerns I had and my family, of course, and everyone else around me, of, of course, had that as well. Um, but um, the perception that people often have is you're like you're you're an easy target then for them right like what can you like a woman traveling on her own she's basically defenseless or something she wouldn't know what to do so on and so forth um there's also other bits of like being a solo traveler as opposed to with someone else there's like a perception that you're doing this because no one else wanted to go with you and there's no like the, no one wanted yeah i mean you don't understand how okay. many times People have asked me, like <laughs> hotel, people in hotels have asked me or hostels or whatever. Have no fun and find somebody like to go with or you couldn't find like, I know, I mean, this was, I think, particularly bad when I went to the Maldives, which I guess makes sense. They're like, you're here on your own? I'm like, I'm going to dive, man. I'm not here for like, <laughs> I don't know what you want from me. I'm not here for the romance, here for the fishes. Thank you. And the sharks. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, no, uh, they, uh, there's a lot of different perceptions. There's a lot of stigma around a Bangladeshi woman traveling on her own. I mean, uh, you probably heard a lot of horror stories from people when you, when you attend like, um, like Wonder Woman brunches and so on, like how many people are being stopped from leaving? Yeah. I've been stopped then and they didn't like, they're like, what, why are you going to, I was going to Brunei and Cambodia and they're like, why are you going there? I'm like. What is it to you? Like, <laughs> we're, you know, I, I lived abroad for so long. So whenever they stop me, I'm like, the audacity. Like, <laughs> it's hard to tell me. But like, it's just we normalize these things so much where there's so many levels like of um, things that are stopping mm -hmm. a woman and particularly Bangladeshi women, right? Mm -hmm. You have to get your family's approval. And if you're married, you have to get your husband's approval or the husband's family's approval you have to get like and once you get all of that and you get like a visa and so on and when you're trying to leave the country there's more barriers and like you know the immigration's like why are you what are you doing where are you going blah 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 and then furthermore you know when you're abroad of course there's like tens of thousands like I've been stopped in so many immigration places where they're like what are you doing traveling on your own in Lebanon they thought I was a domestic help um, because loads of women okay. mm -hmm. taken as domestic help there. And uh, the way they're treated is horrifying. Like literally because they, the way they started talking to me and then as soon as they asked me questions and obviously I, I answered in my accent, you sh see their face drop because they're, they're expecting something else mm -hmm. altogether from the answer and I, I get angry, you know, and I answer back with like so much arrogance when I do, because I'm just like, who do you think you are? Like, how do you get away with just profiling people? And just because they, they, they're broad, they work in your country because your country needs that. Mm -hmm. And then you, you have the audacity to treat people like shit when your country is the one that's expecting them to come over and work. Like, I just get yeah. So there's just a lot of different um, things that, you know, there's that come, you know, come up as like barriers on the way to solo traveling and then also when you're solo traveling. Mm -hmm. So leading to that question, actually, I wanted to ask you, what are some of the safety tips that you always, always apply when you are traveling solo to any place? Um, at this point, it happens so like so often that I travel solo. I think it's like my way of life, maybe. <laughs> um, like I carry, um, you know, like you, pepper mace or pepper spray is not legal in a lot of places. So I carry the hand sanitizer, alcohol liquid thing. Okay. So you know the uh, alcohol, uh, the rubbing alcohol that you can use as hand sanitizer, like that come in spray bottles. Carry that. That and eyes would be very dangerous so oh, okay. use yeah uh use that it, like if in case you have to I hope you don't um um I also carry like if I'm walking alone I walk with keys in between my hands that's a very normal not a normal unfortunately it's a very common practice a lot of women have uh, when they're walking alone they carry keys um I also um wear a lot of rings usually I'd wear a ring on my ring finger just to Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. in case somebody to the to, like, yeah. yeah. Um, other trip uh, tips I would suggest is uh, hiding money. Hide your money in a sanitary pad. No one's gonna look in there. Yeah, <laughs> never thought of that. <laughs> exactly. Who do you think? Exactly. <laughs> I know. That's a good one, isn't it? Yeah. So what's gonna <laughs> open your freaking sanitary? I'm like, oh wow, okay, <laughs> cool, okay, yeah. If if you're gonna be like treated like crap for being a woman, use all the power that you have as a woman. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um. The uh, sorry. One more thing is to wear chunky jewelry. Like I always wear a big ring. Mm -hmm. Also, mm -hmm. in case you have to punch someone, mm -hmm. you could. Yeah. Oh, interesting. When I was in the U.S., I used to carry, you know, those uh, metal uh, water bottles? Yeah. That was the heavy ones. So I used yeah. to carry that because I used to drink water a lot. But then I used to carry it on my hand. In case if somebody <laughs> was around me, I would just turn around and eat that. <laughs> so I think that 
also maybe that's an additional tip that's a really good one and it's <laughs> depressing that this is a discussion we're having yeah like that we have to have this it's so sad I so know. sad I know. <laughs> So the next question for you is, how do you balance out cultural identity because you have been across so many countries and being a Bangladeshi woman, you know, who has lived in different cities as well? How do you balance that out? Um, so this is a very interesting thing because for a long time, especially in my early 20s, I really struggled to grapple with my South Asian identity. I really rejected it in my like late like from when I turned an adult to my early 20s, I'd say I was like very, very strongly against being South Asian, you know, mm -hmm. um, because of the conditioning of media, because of all the things I learned that were like apparently what it means to be a South Asian woman. And then I did a lot of work on it because you you have to, you cannot like reject who you are or who you're born into and so on, like completely without figuring out why you're rejecting it. So um, for me, I have uh, worked really hard on cultivating a very strong relationship with my cultural roots. So practicing parts of Bangladeshi culture wherever I go, whether it's Poyla Bushak, whether it's like Eid or whether it's like Chabi Shemarj or, you know, like Asholoi December, whatever it is, I want to and I, I share information about my culture with different people my country, you know, what it means to be Bangladeshi, what are the color patterns that, you know, make up the tapestry of our culture, what are the different elements that weave together, you know, the essence of a Bangladeshi, uh, the food. Food is such an important way for me to communicate my culture and also to connect with my culture. So very often I cook a lot of different Bangladeshi things for different people. Um, so like for different, like, for example, I would celebrate things uh, with friends and then introduce them to Bangladeshi food and Bangladeshi culture, like bhat, borta, what have you, like maj, uh, biryani, shopkichu, like all the <laughs> things that you can um, you equate. And food is such a huge part of our culture as well. So I love uh, that. And across the world, throughout my life, I don't know how many Bengali meals I've cooked in how many kitchens, in how many cities and countries, and how many times I've made people from completely different cultures eat with their hands and mix flavors and as we mix like stories of our lives and our cultures and you know it, it's such a beautiful and unique way to sort of you know um meet people and to inter and to like mingle with people and mingle and mix your cultures um and for me I think those are elements that I really practice strongly like bits of my culture that I very much value. But then um, in terms of other things, like I think there are many things I disagree with that's happening in Bangladesh and uh, disagree with like a lot of uh, cultural phenomena that's happening. Um, there's a lot of what I've personally experienced is a lot of, um, well, really uh, painful things that people have said to me that are sexist, that are extremely like just horrible to be honest in so many ways and I obviously reject anything that's not um that doesn't have any you know a equality in mind when people are saying those kinds of stuff and perceptions of that um so for me I want to take different bits of all the different cultures that I have had the privilege of experiencing and find a balance um but at its center at its core and at its root I am Bangladeshi and that remains very strongly there and there is no way that I will ever either deny it or ever like uh, give it up mm -hmm. um you know uh, for anything yeah ever so. and one shouldn't I mean that's exactly you know cultures exist and if we kind of like don't celebrate bit by bit then what is left of us right exactly yeah yeah exactly so I have one last question for you, which is, for example, for a person who is an experienced solo traveler who has mm -hmm. visited more than 100 countries, what kind mm -hmm. of advice would you have for uh, aspiring solo travelers who are trying to break the barrier as well? Start with something and somewhere. Start with, even if it's a small trip, even if it's like a weekend trip, a day trip, something, spend an entire day with yourself. 
and try and connect with yourself as you try and see what's out there. You know, you experience something new. Because solo traveling for me is so important because it's such a good method of connecting with yourself. You ask yourself consistently through your travel, who you, like, who are you? What do you want? What do you want to see? What makes you want to see different things? And we are never taught to do that. You know, from when we are little kids, we're always like, we're shaped to think that everything in our lives should be um, do this or do that. Otherwise, what will people think? And your perception of who you are is so shaped by other people and what their perception could possibly be about you that you don't ever really get to explore yourself very much. Like, what? who are you? What do you want to do? Like, do you really want to be what you are, you know, what you're studying? Or is it because your parents want you to be a doctor or your parents want you to be a lawyer? Or is that the only options that you were given since you were a kid? So I think those are very crucial things to talk about and crucial things to think about because uh, that's exactly what solo travel has helped me do is to figure out who, what the essence of who I am is mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the social um, like sort of impositions and mm -hmm. learning that you pick up on the way. Yeah. So spend time with yourselves. It's very important. It's very important to actually self-reflect and learn about what we really want in a world where everybody wants us to be everybody, you know? Like exactly. you want us to be somebody else, but what about us? So thank you exactly. for that very, very sound advice. It's a really inspiring to be speaking to a person like yourself. And on that note, I just want to say thank you so much for, you know, uh, coming on this show and sharing your experience. Um, and sharing about your journey as well, how you've broken barriers and how you continue to inspire so many other women in Bangladesh and beyond who want to solo travel as well. Thank you so much for having me. It's so wonderful to speak to you and it's so great that you're doing this. Like It's amazing that, to see the collection of incredible people we've spoken to and I'm honored to be featured alongside them and to be able to speak to you on this show. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Viewers, thank you so much for watching this episode today. If you have any feedback or suggestions to make, please let me know by emailing me at tasneemhassan.media at gmail.com. The email and all the details will be available on the caption itself. I hope you all took something from this episode today. This is it from me, Tasneem Hassan, signing off. <laughs>